Hello, and welcome to Painted Sky Opera's Met Talks. I'm Danielle Harrington, and we may have met once or twice in the past four years at my pre-show lectures. As PSO's resident musicologist, I'm thrilled to be bringing you a crash course for tonight's Metropolitan Opera stream of Puccini's La Boheme. Considered to be one of the most popular and prevailing operas in the canon, the production you'll see tonight is also monumental. Featuring beloved tenor Luciana Pavarotti and soprano Renata Scotto, this recording comes from 1977 and was PBS's first live from the Met telecast. As Met writer Joel Rosen said, for the first time in Met history, the stargazers watching them numbered in the millions. And now, 40 years later, we gather again to witness these dazzling operatic superstars sing some of the most lush, and mesmerizing melodies. For today's brief talk, I'll touch on the style, moments to listen for, and details about this particular production. Giacomo Puccini was born in 1858 and died in 1924, and was the greatest composer of Italian opera following Verdi. Of the 12 operas Puccini wrote during his life, some of the most influential operas include La Boheme, Tosca, and Madame Butterfly. And of course, tonight we'll be focusing on Bohem. These works all come at the turn of the 20th century, along with many developments in technology, industry, and lifestyle. And we see opera evolving along with this. For those of you who know your humanities and history, poets and writers tended to take risks earlier than musicians. Musical styles often followed in their footsteps 10 to 30 years later. The movements in literature called naturalism and realism started around 1870 and the similar movement in opera following shortly after in 1890 was coined verismo. Verismo denotes realistic elements and comes from the Italian word vero, meaning true. Though it's difficult to create true realism in opera due to the innate artifice of singing since most of us don't go through life singing everything we think. However, there are certain elements that they considered to be more real, like the plot and the characters. While earlier opera often focused on historical figures, mythology, faraway places, Verismo presents everyday people in familiar situations. And these depictions encompass all the realities of life, like falling in love, companionship, friendship, as well as economically struggling or facing death. I chose these topics specifically because they play out in the opera we're about to see. The source text for Puccini's opera comes from Henri Muget's 1845 novel, Sien de la vie de Bohème, or Scenes from the Bohemian Life. The story takes place in the Latin Quarter of Paris, around 1830, and it follows four best friends, a poet, a painter, a philosopher, and a musician. Leading a bohemian lifestyle, they exemplify what we would call today starving artists, struggling to get by for the sake of their art. And isn't it true? <laughs> the other major characters are, of course, sopranos, who act as the love interests. Though four acts long, Puccini's writing is meticulous, succinctly moving through the story in under two hours. Scholars describe Puccini's compositional style as ha a halfway house between Verdi and Wagner. I really liked the way that was worded. So essentially, he continues the Italian tradition of glorious melodies, but he pairs this with the Germanic binding force of the orchestra. He employs long themes that take place in both the vocal line and the orchestra. And these themes are associated with certain characters or their captured emotions, but they're used in such a way that differs from Wagner's leitmotifs. As I delineate the plot next, I'll highlight some of the themes that will enrich your listening experience. In act one and two, we're immersed into the struggling life of Rodolfo and Marcello who are later joined by flatmates, Colleen and Chonard. Notice the conversational way in which they sing to each other and how the orchestra punctuates and connects the sung dialogue. 
As the friends rush off to a cafe with newly acquired money, Rodolfo stays behind and incidentally falls in love with the girl from upstairs. <laughs> it's quick, but it's opera after all. After continued recitative-like scenes, the first true arias appear halfway through the first act, where the tenor and the soprano dazzle us with many, many high notes. But more importantly, they introduce themselves and they reveal who they really are. Intimate details like nicknames and life philosophies. Most notably, the duet they sing following their arias presents a distinct love theme, heard later in the orchestration of Act Four. Puccini reuses this love scene in a very critical moment. It's when their now mature relationship is faced with the reality of sickness and pending death. Listen here. <laughs> note, selfishly, Act 2 happens to be my absolute favorite scene. There's so much hustle and bustle on the crowded streets in Paris. There's a constant activity from the mixture of people on the street, from shoppers and children, soldiers and students, vendors and more. It's all this very exciting, noisy atmosphere where Puccini layers different styles of music. We hear street singing via the chorus, but also a children's chorus emerges. Additionally, the orchestration is very brass heavy and eventually a marching band is heard. And then at some moments, the main characters sort of pop in with moments of recitative. One scholar calls it a real life polyphony of an urban street scene. Now, obviously not our urban, but their urban. I've taught music appreciation now for many years and I always show my non-musician students La Boheme, specifically act one and two. So many of them are wowed by the energy and almost cinematic like continuity experienced in act two. Listen to just a little bit of the beginning here. Between the friends commences, the attention-seeking Musetta enters into the story. A previous lover of Marcello, she appears with her wealthy escort, and in her famous waltz aria, Quando Menvo, she seeks to make him jealous by overtly singing of her captivating beauty and ability to turn heads. Following the famous tune, I argue that Puccini's goal of realism transpires as he seamlessly continues from the aria into the scene. He incorporates other voices into the counterpoint, not only the main characters, but also people in the restaurant. Eventually, the vocal parts dissolve into sort of coherent chatter while Marcello and Musetta dialogue, but the orchestra continues to play Musetta's melody. It's as if the instruments step up in to take over from the distracted characters. Listen here. <laughs>
Siamo all'ultima scena. Il conto così presto. Eventually, the military band takes over and a chaotic street music from the beginning of the act brings the curtain down. Now, Act 1 and 2 introduce the two core relationships of this opera, Rodolfo and Mimi, who represent sincerity and loyalty, and Marcello and Musetta, who represent passion and intensity, albeit not always positive intensity. So the following act, Act 3, serves as a darker exploration of complicated realities that make relationships difficult. Mimi is incredibly ill and Rodolfo is pushing her away because he hates to see her suffer. The quartet that ends this act perfectly depicts the two differing dynamics of the relationships. Interestingly, this iconic melody heard first in the duet and then developed into the quartet was actually reused material from earlier in Puccini's career. Puccini originally wrote this music for an art song called Sole ed Amore, published in 1888, eight years prior to La Boheme. Here's an excerpt that illustrates the power of this melody, as Rodolfo and Mimi express true and tender love for each other. We have Musetta and Marcello bickering. The captivating melody cuts through Mozetta's laughter and Marcello's outrage and soars so intensely that the bickering couple actually join in before they scream at each other and leave. The violins take over, but Rodolfo and Mimi return to the melody once more, pledging to stay together. Listen here. <laughs> of earlier music from the opera. For instance, the Bohemian's theme, fueled with verve and suitably upbeat tempi, returns as the roommates prepare for dinner at the onset of the act. The music evolves as they playfully escape into imaginative scenarios. <laughs> E piatto degno di te mostre, una vigna, salata, il bravo e tavola, e si cucagna da vendicaccio. Por lo champagne mettiamo in ghiaccio. Ego parole, tronco salmone. Sadly, La Boheme follows the long tradition in opera of sopranos who die in the end. But the genuine commitment of friendship softens the bittersweet end as the friends do all they can to comfort Mimi. Colleen's aria is especially effective here for emotional impact as he sacrifices his treasured coat to buy Mimi medicine. It also provides a rare moment for the bass to shine. As I wrap up this talk, I'll quickly speak now about the singers you'll be hearing next. 
This particular production was not only the first to be broadcast on TV by the Met, but also was a notable visual change in terms of the set design. Rather than using Franco Zeffirelli's extravagant, opulent production that became so popular in the 1960s and is now visually representative of Bohème, the 1977 Pavarotti Scotto production was actually borrowed from the Chicago Lyric Opera and designed by Pierre Luigi Pizzi. And his artistic vision really remains quite traditional and in line with the original visual conception. In the New York Times Review the following day this aired, the writer Harold C. Schoenberg commented on Pavarotti's new bits of stage business. He said this, quote, Pavarotti has always been a rather interesting figure on stage. For one of his bulk, he moves with unusual grace. He is something of the comedian in him and often gives the feeling that he is actually poking fun at himself. At other times, he can be as stilted as any tenor, going through the emotions by rote, open mouth for anguish, and so on. The audience loved some of his touches last night. He hears Mimi's voice, a woman. He slicks his hair down before a mirror and adjusts his clothes before opening the door. He also used some well-known Italian gestures that caused hoots of laughter. Nobody around today can sing a better Rodolfo, end quote. And when commenting on Scotto's performance, the Times writer noted her singing as sensuous with a full exploitation of dynamics. Though he did say that there were one or two bad high notes that come along with her singing and that everybody is now used to them. I have to say for the uncountable amounts of times that I have seen La Boheme in various productions, I have not heard this particular dynamic duo. But I am interested to see next if the reviewers' opinions do ring true. Thank you so much for your generous attention. I hope this video was informational and properly prepared you for the marvelous show to come. Enjoy. Daniel Braccio, mia pizza. 